Well, hello everybody. It's Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dansfish.com. And today I want to tell you about these little guys behind me. These are peacock gudgeons. And today we're going to talk about how I spawn them and take care of the eggs and get the fry started and going because they can be a little tricky to get going. But I'll give you my best tips and tricks and show you all about it. All right, here we go. So this is the aquarium they're spawning in. It's a 75 gallon bare bottom aquarium and I just have some of these PVC pipe pieces in there. You can see a pair in the back there in that pipe spawning and we'll zoom in in a little bit and take a closer look. Um, a lot of people put a cap on the back of their PVC pipe and that might work a little better. I just haven't gotten around to it but they spawn just is fine in these um, kind of open PVC sections. I would say that each section is about two and a half to three inches long and it's three quarter inch PVC pipe that I'm using to spawn them. So there's a sponge filter in here, a box filter in here, a few floating plants and a little bit of java moss, but nothing fancy at all. I bet that these would spawn just fine in an almost bare aquarium as well as long as there was plenty of PVC selection in it. So this pair he selected this pipe. Um, the male is in the front there, and if you look to the right-hand side there, that kind of dark patch on the pipe, on the inside of the pipe, that's all their eggs sticking to the pipe there. So they're spawning, or have spawned, the female's in the back there. The male's kind of standing guard, <laughs> checking out everyone that swims by and saying, hey, get away from here. That's kind of his job between spawning rounds. And that's kind of how they do it. They select a spot, the male claims the spot, attracts a female to the spot, they hang out for a couple days until she's ready to spawn and then they lay eggs. Um, and they're, they're pretty simple to do. Here's another male, he's claimed this pipe. No female yet, but in a couple days he'll have one. And there's several pairs in here. Here's another pair in a different pipe to the left there. It's a little bit grainy, but you can, you can make them out and I don't know if they've spawned or are spawning right now but there there's a little action going on in there now here's a male that in a different pipe that has spawned and as you can see he's got a bunch of eggs in there with him and he'll go around and fan them and care for them and he continuously kind of sits over them and fans his fins around to make sure they get constant water flow over the eggs so they get enough oxygen and so that they remain clean. So here's a little closer up, you can see them a little bit better. Um, sorry for that haziness, those waves in the water. I put a little bit of salt in here in the front of the aquarium and we have to look through the salt haze <laughs> to, to see his spawning site. But um, a pretty good view of the eggs in there. They're good sized eggs, these are not small eggs and the fry actually hatch pretty big although they have a small mouth so they're a little tricky to feed. That's where the challenge comes in and, and we'll talk about that in a minute as soon as we show the, uh, the fry hatching which we'll get to here shortly. But anyway, good view of the male incubating his eggs. This was a very good daddy, this, this uh, batch raised up. If you look close you can see the little embryos in the eggs kind of not swimming around but, but moving around, exercising, uh, getting adjusted and ready for life as they kind of strengthen their muscles. So, really cool. Now this is something that doesn't usually happen. They almost always pick a pipe or a little cave on the bottom of the aquarium. This couple, however, decided they wanted to try to spawn on a leaf. And so I took some footage of it, not because I think this is a good idea to try to spawn on a leaf. In fact, their spawn was not successful. They just can't possibly defend a leaf as well as they can a cave. But because they're kind of out in the open so we can see some behavior here that you almost never see because they're usually in a cave. Um, so this male there that was out front a second ago, his breeding pipe is down and very easy to see and he was just out chasing some other males away and now in between trying to keep other fish away from the spawning site, this is fast forwarded a little bit but we're gonna see him kind of nudging the female trying to coax her to spawn as he in between bouts of keeping other fish away from his territory there. And it's just a neat little behavior that that you don't get to see clearly usually, again, because it's usually blocked by the sides of the cave or the pipe or whatever they're spawning in. So I thought it'd be neat to just take a minute and, and take a look at this behavior that we don't usually get to see well. So it's, it's fast forwarded. This is about six times normal speed 
but it gives you an idea of kind of the constant coaxing and spinning. Now this is, I went up close with the camera, and this little guy came right up and, and chased me away. So they're fearless at this stage. That's the male doing this, the female staying back on the leaf. You can tell the male because he gets a, a kind of a big nuchal hump on his head. At this size, this is maybe an inch and a half, this fish. They get three inches, so this is a small one. At this size, the hump isn't well developed, but the trained eye can tell. I can tell that's the male. Um, so there's a couple different ways to incubate the eggs. This is option one, which is cap both sides of the pipe, pick it up with the water trapped inside with the male and the eggs and everything, and move it to another container to incubate. This is my least favorite method, but it can work. I would give it a 50% probability of success. Sometimes the male gets so spooked that he abandons the pipe and the eggs, or even eats them, but about half the time this could work. Here's another method, this works pretty well. Take the pipe out, put it in the bottom of another small aquarium. This is a five and a half gallon aquarium. And then behind it, put an uplift pipe. That's what that pipe, um, that vertical pipe you see behind the pipe with the eggs in it is. It's an uplift pipe with an air stone in it. And so that's constantly drawing water up that uplift pipe. So the water kind of goes across the eggs before it goes into the uplift pipe. So it's this constant circulation over the eggs. If you do this, give it pretty good flow. These guys need a pretty good amount of oxygen and water movement in order to hatch successfully. So this method is pretty darn successful. If you don't have an egg tumbler, this is kind of the poor man's egg tumbler setup. You just <laughs> put the pipe in, put a vertical piece of PVC behind it with an air stone in it to create that flow. So this is option two. The best option is this, an egg tumbler in a container of water with some hydrogen peroxide in it. I put two milliliters of hydrogen peroxide per gallon in the container. The eggs are in that pipe, in that egg tumbler, and I've cut out a piece of green scrubby pad to put in the bottom so the eggs don't fall through. This is the next day. The eggs have hatched. So basically, I leave the eggs in with the male. This is my preferred method. Leave the eggs in with the male until they turn pretty dark, which means they're about to hatch. You can see the eyes of the well-developed fry in there. Then take them out, put them in this container with the egg tumbler, and with a day, within a day or two, they'll have hatched. And when they hatch, they're usually free swimming immediately, like these guys are, or within a few hours or a day maybe at most. So these are all free swimming, a little closer view to them. And here's where the challenge comes in. Right now, they've still got some egg yolk sac there. I haven't done much in the way of feeding these guys. And so they can live on that for a little bit, but they will also start going and hunting some stuff down. And there's just a little bit of infusoria and stuff in here that's naturally occurring in this container. And they kind of go around and browse on that and eat that. And that's their first food. They're too small to take newly hatched brine shrimp right away. So let me talk about how I feed them. This is kind of a live food culture setup and on the bottom tank here you'll see it's super cloudy. All that white cloudiness, that's infusoria that I'm growing for these baby fry. And so how I do that is this is a 20 gallon long aquarium. There's a lot of life in here. These are detritus worms, there's scuds, there's snails, there's black worms. And I treat this like I would a fish tank. So there's a sponge filter in here and all that. And the way I get it to bloom is I just put this vegetable matter in here. So old boiled apple cores, this is boiled, uh, actually I think that's an old lemon peel, boiled pumpkin, boiled zucchini, algae wafers, any kind of vegetable matter like that. Usually boiled makes it work better. Keep that in there and it'll bloom this white infusoria. Then, once the fry are free swimming, I move them to this little five and a half gallon aquarium we're looking at now and I feed them that infusoria for the first two days. On the third day, I'll put in infusoria and I'll start mixing in baby brine shrimp, which you can see a few of them hopping around right now. Now, they're eating mostly infusoria still at this stage, not many brine shrimp, but I have a few brine shrimp in there just in case a few of them are big enough to eat it. And I have snails in here and I have scuds in here and I have black worms in here to eat any brine shrimp that, that the little fish can't eat. So 
I don't put a ton in there to start with, just a little bit to kind of get them used to it and get them hunting it and things. And then after a few days of feeding, okay, so first it's infusory for a couple days, then it's mostly infusory with a little bit of brine shrimp for a few days. And then once I see them actively and successfully eating the brine shrimp, then I'll cut out the infusoria and switch just to brine shrimp. So that's what makes these guys tricky. They're fairly good sized fry for an, a small egg layer. They're every bit as big as, they're even bigger I would say than like gardener eye, killifish fry or um, aphiosemen australi or things like that. But their mouths are pretty small for how big they are. So getting that infusoria for the first several days and then combining them until they're eating the baby brine shrimp successfully is key. Now they're probably four days old at this point, and as you can see, they're eating these baby brine shrimp no problem. So I put a few in there just so we can see them do that, and if you look, you'll just see them hunting it down and eating it, and it's they're having a great time. <laughs> the fish, not the brine shrimp. And so that's at about four days or so is when these, this batch was big enough to just eat brine shrimp. Once they get to that point, they're as easy to raise as any other egg layer, pretty much. Um, but they're hardy fish, they're not difficult. The only challenge is they have a small mouth at the beginning. And it only really takes a few days of infusoria to get them to this point. So you could just take a little jar and get an infusoria culture going. You don't need a big aquarium, like I have that 20 gallon aquarium. You could just do enough to get you through a few days to brine shrimp and you'll be golden. Um, now I'm, this is the morning, so I'm gonna put a bunch in here. And in my water, the brine shrimp will last, if I put it in the morning, it'll last till mid-afternoon. So I put quite a bit in here so that the fish can just hunt it down all day long, basically, and eat all day long, and that way they're fat and happy and get good growth. So also, this is an, on a water, an auto water change system. This gets a small water change six to eight times a day. So over a 24 hour period, 100% of the water is changed over the course of a 24 hour period. So I'm fast forwarding here for about, oh, 15, 20 minutes as we watch these guys. Actually, no, that was about a 10 minute video that I fast forwarded here, just so we can watch these guys hunt them down. And then we've slowed back down and now look at their bellies, the difference between before and now. They're just big, fat, happy bellies. <laughs> this is what you want to see on your fry. Um, big swollen bellies full of brine shrimp. That's when you're on easy street. So the trick now is just keep food in front of them and keep the water clean. That's it. And then they'll just grow. This is a couple days later. You can see they've got some more size to them. They grow really quickly at this stage if you keep food in front of them. Um, so that's how I do it. I think the big trick for me is kind of putting a lot of life into the aquarium with the fry. So there's black worms in here, there's snails, there's all that infusoria that I put in there before. Um, there's some shrimp in here, some cherry shrimp, things like that. And just kind of that, that living community helps balance things out. There's some plants in here. That way if the baby uh, fish don't eat all the baby brine shrimp, it doesn't just sit in there and rot the other critters go around and, and kind of clean it up. So that's how I avoid kind of overfeeding or fouling the tank if I feed more than the fish can eat. That with the water changes works well. And again, that infusoria is the key to getting them through the first stage. Anyway, that's how I spawn these guys, care for the eggs and raise the babies. Well, there they are. That's how I breed and raise the peacock gudgeons. And yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> the method of the madness that I use. If you have any questions about them, uh, if you leave a comment down below, I'd be happy to answer them or just discuss with you or geek out on these amazing fish if you want. I think they're awesome. If you like this video and you haven't done so yet, if you'd consider subscribing, liking, sharing, clicking the notification bell, all that other schmaz that us YouTubers are always saying, <laughs> please do, then uh, I would appreciate it if you take a moment to consider doing any of those. And until next time, I'll see you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Um,